Hey everybody, it's Bart Massey again. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to be talking about hearing because talking about sound without talking about how we hear it is a silly and pointless exercise. I hope everybody's feeling safe out there uh, and let's go ahead and dive into this topic. Uh, someday I won't learn how to work a computer. So When we're talking about hearing, we start with the ears. And there's a most excellent article here about by the um, National Institute of Deafness and Other Communications Disorders, the NIDCD. It's an article about how we hear that I re have really enjoyed reading because I think it's a really complete and clear description of the process. Uh, so, to understand it, we kind of have to understand the structure of the ear itself. We got the outer ear, what's called the pinna. We've got the ear canal and the eardrum. So this whole system is the open air part of the system and the eardrum is there partly as a membrane to keep liquid and other things from getting inside. But it's also rigged in a really funny way. Um, when sound pressure waves hit the eardrum, it vibrates. Those vibrations are actually amplified by a weird little lever system of sorts with three bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes. The stapes is the smallest bone in the human body. And those bones vibrate at the entrance to the cochlea. And the cochlea is where all the real action of hearing happens. Uh, if you, uh, look at the shape of the cochlea in this diagram, you see that it's sort of a, a snail shape, sort of a spiral shape in toward the middle. It turns out that that spiral is got a little membrane running along it halfway through that has little hair cells on it. And the hair cells vibrate back and forth um, in response to the sound and they can hit these other cells, the um, the uh, basilar membrane hair cells and the stereocilia, that was what I was trying to think of, sit on top of the, sit, sit next to the hair cells and basically if, or kind of above them. And when the um, hair cells vibrate, they can hit the stereocilia, and that's how we detect sound. This whole passage is fluid filled, so we're actually pro, pro, um, propagating sound in water at this point, so that's interesting too. And the shape of this thing matters. Uh, this little snail spiral thing is rigged in a funny way so that sounds that get farther down the s spiral actually turn out to be lower frequency sounds. This is essentially a filter. And so the stereocilia that detect sound along the outer part are detecting higher frequency sounds selectively. Um, well, not selectively, they're detecting the higher frequency sounds. As we get closer to the center, we're selectively detecting lower and lower frequency sounds. And so What's happening here is that um, we actually have a device that inside our heads that converts from the time domain to the frequency domain. And this is why, part of why frequencies are so important is that the ear doesn't actually hear sound pressures. It's not like a microphone. The ear hears sound frequencies and your brain's processing is all done in the frequency domain, which is a really interesting thing and not something you might have guessed until you know, fairly recently in the history of the world. So the ear detects frequency directly and the amplitude of those frequencies is sort of logarithmic in the sampled sound power. So, um, so the, that says measured, it should probably say heard in the notes. You will hear uh, small differences um, in sound are, are really audible at low power. If there's a big difference in the sound, then the, then at low power, it, um, sorry. Yeah, you, you hear big differences at low power. And at high power, the differences, the same difference will be 
heard smaller. And because of that, we generally use logarithmic units. We use decibels as our basic unit of sound um, measurement. So we measure the sound power in decibels, which for reasons is the 20 log, 20 times the log base 10 of the RMS power is the power in decibels. But what's this divided by 10 to the minus 12th? Well, it turns out that the units here would be watts but it turns out watts are a very big unit when you're talking about the ear. And so instead we use picowatts, 10 to the minus 12th watts. And so uh, the scale you know, is set such that um, 10 dB is a pretty tiny amount of power. Um, and it's interesting, one of, the, one of the sort of interesting asides to me is that this has some interesting implications that have been known for a long time. Namely that if you put a volume knob on your old school analog device or really even on your modern digital device, right? If you have the volume go up linearly as you turn it, um, then that's not going to sound like a linear change in volume. It's going to sound like the most of the action in the volume control is going to be clear down at the bottom. And so instead, what we do is we actually have the thing ramp up according to a log scale if we're going to make a volume knob. And so the literal physical potentiometers, the things that actually volume knobs have traditionally been made of, are these resistors that vary in resistance. And there's sort of two tapers. There's what's called a A taper or audio taper in the US. And that's the one that sort of, as you turn the knob, it goes up like the inverse log, actually, to compensate, right, for the log frequency response. It goes up like, the power goes up like the inverse log of the position on the volume knob. And a linear pot wouldn't do the right thing. Sorry, it's a log pot. Yeah, yeah, it's a log pot. And so, and so, and you'll notice here that those not those lines, the dashed line and the blue line here, indicating the amount of resistance, doesn't go up as actually a log curve. The manufacturers just cheat and approximate the log curve with two linear curves because for some reason that makes potentiometers easier easier to make. And it turns out that log that linear curve is that you know bilinear curve is sort of close enough to a log curve that it makes everybody happy. Um, it's interesting that, you know, welcome to the world of units. Uh, this is known in America as, you know, the linear pot is a B pot, the log pot is an A pot. Um, in Europe, of course, the linear pot is an A pot and the log pot is a C pot. So that's always nice. Uh, it's, you know, welcome to the world of standards. But the point is, back to our actual topic, um, it's important to understand that hearing is logarithmic. It's going to control a lot of what we do. But of course, hearing doesn't hearing doesn't stop at the ear. It's a function of our brains too and how they process sound. Uh, the brain has got a whole bunch of complicated mechanism in it designed to make hearing work well for us. And that mechanism is mostly automatic. We don't have any real control over it. So there's a whole system of you know, sort of sound processing in the brain that's moderately well understood, but the deeper, as usual with the brain, the deeper you go into it, the less well it's understood. Um, the, you know, the perceived volume of a sound is a function of sound power, sure, but it's also a function of the background level in the environment. It turns out that if the environment's very quiet, you will hear fairly quiet sounds as being fairly loud. I mean, everybody knows that. It's not like there's any news there. And whereas if, you know, there's a very loud environment around you, then it takes a very loud, loud sound, even relative to, you know, the background to stand out as loud. So your brain's playing that game. There's also another interesting phenomenon. I mean, we could have probably a 10 week course if I knew more on just psychoacoustics, but Another interesting phenomenon I've 
paid attention to for a long time. It turns out that, remember those sinusoids I was showing you earlier? It turns out that if you clip the tops off those, uh, the brain sort of fills that back in to some extent. It sort of treats that like a sine wave that got to, you know, that, that wasn't clipped off, which is really interesting. And it has to do with the fact that it's pretty common in nature and also certainly in electronics and computers and sound to actually have limits on how, you know, on how high or low a pressure can go. And so the brain's trying to figure out what pressure was implied by this clipped waveform. And it does a reasonable job of that. And advertisers and other kinds of broadcasters uh, who are trying to get your attention will often deliberately use a clipped sound. In particular, CDs have been released almost for the entire life of the CD, normally with clipped versions of the audio. And that's because historically, back when radio was a bigger thing for music, you wanted to people would stop at a radio station that was sort of the loudest sounding one that they ran into early and because that sounded like a better signal. And so it was to your advantage if you were trying to get your radio station listened to to have loud sounding music. And there are limits on how loud you can actually make the music, how long, you know, sort of limits imposed by broadcast regulations, but also by just the way radio broadcasts work. And so they wanted this perceived high loudness, and so the they literally the CDs would be mastered clipped so that the, those songs would get more airplay. Um, what that means is that even though CD audio is a really good quality audio, in principle, in practice, you know, you'd look at it in a thing and it's like, ew, this has got all the wave tips clipped off. So yeah, um, your brain is playing all kinds of games with volume. It also plays all kinds of games with frequency. Uh, you know, first of all, it's very, very rare that you find an individual, and I've read a lot about this and sort of don't feel like anyone has a very good handle on how common it is, but certainly not one in 10, and probably not one in 100, and maybe not one in a million people can actually listen to a sound and tell you what the pitch is, either in terms of musical notes or kilohertz or anything else. Our brain isn't really normally set up for that, and it takes some training even if you have that talent. And a lot of people have tried to train it and not even made that work. And so how do we know sort of what a pitch sounds like? Well, you know, obviously we can get a very broad idea. We listened last lecture to tones at 60 hertz and 15 kilohertz and 1 kilohertz and if I asked you which played some tone and asked you which of those three it was closest to you'd probably have a pretty good idea but more to the point we pitch is mostly relative uh, we when we're judging the pitch of a sound we listen to other pitches that are playing at the same time uh, pitches that are playing you know in the background pitches that are playing at, you know in the foreground at the same volume but are different pitches and we you know we remember earlier pitches we've heard there's a very famous phenomenon in music which we'll come to later in this course where the first note that's played and the first chord that's played in a song sort of sets your brain for that song to what the song's supposed to, you know, what pitch the sound the song is sort of pitched to. And very much later, you can move that all around and play all kinds of games. And very much later, when, you know, minutes later, you come back to that original thing you started with and your brain still remembers that's where you started. And it's like, ah, there we are. That's back where we started. So there's a lot of that. The other thing that we should be clear about is that, you know, just as volume is dependent on a bunch of other things we talked about, it's also sort of dependent on frequency. And our ear likes to sort of judge pitch based on sort of middle, middle high components of frequency. So um, if we look at a, this A weighting chart, um, the A weighted decibel is sort of a measure of loudness as a function of frequency, and it's not even at all. So, um, well, this used to have a nice link in it, which apparently is gone now. Um, used to have a little chart. Uh, 
right here. Oh, that's nice. So, uh, anyway, there's, you know, I'll just Google one up, I'm sure. A waiting, waiting chart. Uh, there we go. There's a nice curve. Um, that... that you can sort of see here that's uh the sort of blue curve here is sort of a standard curve used in the audio business that says you know that you sort of the peak in loudness is somewhere between a kilohertz and 10 kilohertz and over that range it's sort of medium flat again notice that frequencies are perceived logarithmically um, and we'll talk more about that later, just like pitches are just like uh, volume is. And so we've got a log-log scale here. We've got log frequency, we've got log um, amplitude. But the point is that, you know, by the time you get down to 60 hertz, your, your perception's sort of 40 decibels down, which is a lot. And so that's why that sound that we played last lecture, the 60 hertz sound, didn't sound very, very... Uh... So an interesting audio illusion, and one that I'm... I've always enjoyed is this thing called shepherd tones and this takes advantage of two things it takes advantage of the fact that higher frequencies are heard more than lower frequencies it also takes advantage more importantly of accommodation over time of the idea that the ear gets used to what it's hearing and so thirdly it takes gets used to you know a pitch is judging the pitch based on the previous pitch and all those things combine together to produce a really nice effect here so um, if you listen to these tones uh, what you'll hear is that they seem to be going up and 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 if you listen for a very long time what you'll notice finally is that actually these tones don't ever stop. This video is only, I don't know, 15 minutes long, but that whole 15 minutes it will sound like the tone's going up dramatically. And obviously that's not a real thing. What's the trick to this? Well, the trick to it is that um, these shepherd tones you can sort of see in this this is called a uh, uh, let's see this is called a sound spectrogram and what you see is that there are these um, notes that start low and rise throughout time and they're all being played at the same time so at any given time slice you get a thing and then at the next time slice you get a thing that sounds higher eventually these high frequency components disappear but they're replaced by these lower frequency components coming in. So it's a really fun illusion. My, one of my all time favorite pinball machines is Stern's Galaxy. And Galaxy used this shepherd tone trick to build tension. As you played the pinball game, that you'd get this endlessly rising tone. And it really, really made it dramatic to play the game because you'd start to get really stressed out by the fact that this thing, you know, the longer you kept the ball in play, the more, the more it was going up, even though that wasn't a real thing. So that's a good example of an audio illusion, which is not a thing you hear every day. Next, we need to talk about a topic that arguably should have been the first topic in this course. It's super important. So if you paid attention to nothing else, Please pay attention to this. This is hearing safety. Uh, I really, really need you to not damage your hearing, both in this class especially, but also in your life. Uh, most Americans suffer a lot of hearing damage. And one of the problems with hearing damage is that it's cumulative, A, over your lifetime, and B, it doesn't really start to show up its effects that much until you get older. And so if you're a younger person listening to this, uh, try to get older without going deaf and you'll really increase your odds if you're careful. So hearing is unfortunately pretty easy to damage. We, don't, we aren't really built for the loud kinds of electronic amplified environments, um, environments with a lot of loud environmental noise that we're subjected to in the modern world. And so, uh, 
some things you should know. First of all, sound exposure is cumulative. If you have a long expo exposure to a sort of medium loud sound, that's worse in some ways than a shorter exposure to a louder sound. Um, you know, it's it's uh, one of those things where, you know, everybody's careful around guns because they're, among other reasons, because they're so loud and they all wear hearing protection. And it's obvious why, and you obviously feel the effects of hearing a gunshot without hearing protection. That's something that drives me nuts with movie guns is that, you know, people fire them without any kind of hearing protection and then talk to the person next to him. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, and so the, but the point is that a long airplane trip is a fairly loud sound for eight hours. That's bad too. A machine room, that kind of stuff. Um, the National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health say that if you have more than sort of a heavy city traffic level of noise around you over eight hours, that's a serious uh, that's a serious hearing risk. If you get more than about 130 decibels, which is sort of jet engine levels, yeah, that can acutely damage your hearing. Um, gun gunshots are in that volume range. And notice that you know people worry about deafness. Uh, there's plenty of other problems that you can have with hearing damage that are as bad or worse. Tinnitus is something that one of the doctors and scientists up at OSHU is studying a lot. That's the ringing noises and similar that you get in your ears. It's pretty clear that long exposures to loud noises um, can cause permanent tinnitus. Um, you really don't want that. It's not a very fun thing to live with. Also, it's pretty common if you listen to the same frequency loudly for a long time that you, your ear is damaged. The part of your cochlea that senses those frequencies is damaged, and so you end up with a notch in your hearing. Uh, it was really common when I was younger, back when we had CRTs, tube televisions and tube monitors instead of LCDs. Um, those typically generate a fairly loud sound around 15 kilohertz because of how they work. And uh, it was very common for people who worked around CRTs a lot to end up with a 15 kilohertz notch as they got older. They just couldn't hear sounds around the CRT flyback place. So what do you do about all this? Obviously, ear protection's a thing. It's one of those things like helmets that seems to get more in vogue every decade. If you're going to a concert, modern concerts are ridiculously over-amplified because it sounds better and because they have a whole bunch of deaf people in the audience because they've been listening to concerts too loud without hearing protection. Definitely take your earplugs, definitely wear them. Uh, I strong, you know, a machine room is an environment you'll encounter as a computer scientist. Uh, machine rooms tend to be very loud. I strongly recommend that you bring hearing protection into the machine room. I've tried to be really careful about that for most of my life. Um, I strongly recommend noise canceling headphones. Certainly, some kinds of headphones, but you know, the noise canceling ones work best. Um, on airplanes, uh, it'll make you a lot more comfortable. Uh, and we'll talk later about how those work. Earbuds are known to be a problem because your brain doesn't really know how to deal with this sound that isn't processed by your pinna and coming from an external source. Those earbud sounds are perceived as softer than they actually are. And you end up turning up the volume when you have earbuds to compensate and end up with way too loud and you get hearing damage. Um, the best plan for earbuds is just don't. But if you must use them, you know, listen to where they sound the best and then turn them down probably 10 or 20 dB from that because that's where they really should be. And what you'll find is your brain will accommodate to that fine. It'll sound fine. So a classic thing for audio engineers to do to their hearing is to damage it by either blasting themselves with a loud tone or leaving things too loud. The standard, you should get in the habit right now of any time you're about to produce a sound, you should turn the volume all the way down, 
start the sound and then turn the volume up to a comfortable level where it should be. Uh, you know, it's classic to start with the volume up too high and blast the thing. And that can be really a problem, uh, especially a bigger problem is you set it a little too high and you don't notice that you're blasting the thing. And then you've got a long time of loud exposure. When you are using headphones, which is a thing that you'll be doing a lot as an audio engineer, it's really, really important not to put them over your ears and then turn on the sound because there's a million ways that you can absolutely blast your ears into oblivion by mistake. So instead, what smart people do is they start with the headphones away from their ears on their neck where they can still hear what's coming out of them, but it's not going to hurt them at maximum volume. And then you... Um, you know, make sure that your volumes are all turned down, all that kind of thing, and then turn up the volume a little bit. Make sure that the headphones don't sound very loud. Now you can put them on your ears and turn up the volume slowly and everything will be okay. Um, and yeah, if you're messing around with mute buttons, with plugs and jacks, that kind of stuff, again, take off your headphones before you start working with the stuff. Again, turn down the volumes before you start working with stuff whenever possible because it's really, really super easy to hurt yourself. So please be safe and careful out there. Um, you know, I can't be with you every second, and I certainly don't want this class to cause anybody any hearing damage, so please, please be careful. The last topic I wanted to talk about with hearing, and then we'll be done with this one, is to talk a little bit about the fact that hearing is through two ears, typically. I have a friend who can hear only in one ear, and they have a very different experience of sound, I think, probably, than somebody who can hear in stereo. Most of us can't. So um, what that means is that sort of you have these two separate sensors, and they're redundant in the sense that you can work well enough with just one of them, but the extra information provided by this pair of sensors is used by your brain a lot in figuring out things about sound. Um, and, of course... Because of that, we have this whole thing in audio of audio being often, often, often stereo, meaning that we try to produce a different sound in the left ear than in the right ear. Sorry, left ear than in the right ear. And uh, that's a thing that um, we're going to have to take into account as we start missing the sound. Um, so... The differences between the left ear sound and the right ear sound are usually small relative to the sound itself. And so it's pretty common to actually, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about digital audio, to, co to actually store or transmit the stereo as a sort of a single average channel that says well this is what the sound would sound like if you only listen to it with one ear and then different signals to say well what is the difference between the two ears that's you know that's an interesting thing because it turns out because the difference is so small you can transmit it with or store it with less fidelity so fm radio for example absolutely uses this plan of sending the mono signal and a different signal one of the side advantages of that is if you have something that's only a mono system a single speaker for example well you just ignore the difference channel and play the mono channel and you're good to go localization in space is a fascinating topic to me you know when you hear a sound you usually have some notion not a great notion but some notion of where it is angle wise is it on your left is it on your right and you have some notion of how far away it is is it close is it far and your stereo hearing makes a big part of the angle measurement in particular is because you have two ears and so the ear does different things depending on what uh, what frequencies it's trying to localize. It turns out below one kilohertz, the ear tends to use phase. So it, if you have a 60 hertz sine wave coming in on your right ear and on your left ear, you'll notice that the wave is significantly delayed 
by the propagation distance between your right and left ear, right? It's going to get to, if the sound's on my right, it'll hit this ear, and then later it will hit this ear. Um, and so that phase difference is actually measured. Um, but that really only works at low frequencies, because at higher frequencies, you know, below a kilohertz, sort of my head's less than a foot long and so the phase differences are going to be ambiguous and so it doesn't work so much so instead it uses a thing called group delay which i don't really want to talk about today but it also uses something that's kind of obvious which is head interference it turns out that lower frequency sounds because your head is big relative to them don't propagate very well from one ear to the other so if i hear a high frequency sound on the right it'll be much louder on the right than on the left and that's how that gets localized um and also the ear, it turns out, the outer ear, the pinna, um, the ear part of your ear, makes a big difference of in this. It turns out the folds in your ear actually serve a purpose. They aren't just decorative. They are there because the sound gets, you know, higher, higher frequency sounds, right, get transmitted differently depending on how they bounce off the folds in the ear on the way into your ear canal and your brain learns to process all that out and so it can have a pretty good estimate for higher frequency sounds of where they're coming from because of the way they bounce off the ear so that's interesting um there's also distance effects it turns out that softer lower frequency sounds seem farther away from you um and that's and that that's because in real life right sound pressure drops off as the square of the distance and so yeah you're farther away it is probably the the louder the softer it's going to be and it turns out higher frequency sounds propagate less well through air our sort of upper hearing limit around 15 to 18 kilohertz is because partly because air doesn't propagate sound so well over at distance beyond that frequency range and so you can hear lower frequency sounds farther away. That, by the way, is a big deal underwater where um, very low frequency sound is used a lot because high frequency sounds don't propagate much at all in water. Um, the other thing is that, so room effects. If you hear reflections, meaning delayed echoes, that kind of stuff, those are going to increase your perceived distance. It turns out that you know, far away sounds are more likely to bounce off something, near sounds aren't, and your brain there again is very good at picking that up. So, this is already seeming complicated. We haven't even really touched computers yet. We've got all these things with sound itself and with hearing that we've got to internalize. And the good news is, having that background, we're now in a position to actually start tackling the computer parts of it and the next lectures will be about how to deal with computers and sound. So thanks for listening. Stay safe out there and I will talk to you again.